Yeah, so it's it's uh, good seeing you again, David. Nick, it's always good to be with you. I remember last time we had to have, we had lunch at the PDAC. It was about a year ago, and yeah. always enjoyed being with you. And I think it was a particular good uh, you know conversation back and forth. But I know I don't know what you're going to ask you. I just want to start right off hard and strong. And you know, I really appears to me. I don't want to be overly dramatic that the silver market is broken in some way i think it's pretty know, it's absolutely crazy like the we're, we're trying to track the slv closely day by day but it's it's gone into what about a two percent discount so so that means they got more more shares sold than they got silver and and the, the big question is where they're getting this volume of physical silver, because with the GLD and gold, they they can borrow the gold from the central banks, but there aren't any huge above ground stockpiles of silver that I could find. Uh, so there's a big question where the silver is coming from. Well, that's always been the question, I think, at least from the big perspective. And, you know, I think, I forget who it was, what, give them credit, I can't remember, but you know, a lot of the silver doesn't move. I get, I know I've known that for years, but there's a like a tag on it. This JPM silver, take that tag off and put this one on. It says HSBC. And yeah. that was a transaction that took place electronically. Okay, I get that. Right. But what I have been screaming about for years is that they hypothecate, rehypothecate, lease swap, and all these other things that are legal when you read the prospectus. But you don't know who's the honest to God owner of all this silver, right? right. Well, and the, and, the, and the big thing, according to like I, IMF rules for central banks is, is when a central bank leases uh, gold, for example, then title to the gold remains with the central bank, yeah. even if they park it in the vaults of the GLD. So the fact that they do a... a, a a list of of bars that doesn't mean they own them yeah i'm gonna interrupt i mean it's one of my favorite expressions is location doesn't prove ownership that's right and i don't know how many hundreds of times i've said that and one of the silver summits we had sort of halfway through i think it went for about 20 years or so uh we had a gentleman invited uh from the options uh den of the uh, L lbma and i mean he was insistent that because it laid in their vault, it was theirs. And I just kept uh, saying that doesn't prove it's yours. Just because I mean, it's no on more your than the floor doesn't mean that you own it. Yeah. No more than the BMW in my garage is mine. It belongs to the leasing company. <laughs> yeah, right. Just because it's in my garage doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm getting, you know, I've done analytical work on uh, the metals for my life and I look at all the commodities really, but and not only does it feel different, it seems as if we might be getting to that tipping point, that critical juncture where two months from now we'll be having a different conversation because A, the rules change, B, they're allocating metal only to certain parties. C, I mean, make something up. But what do you, am I off base? Do you have the same gut feeling? What are your thoughts? Oh, I, I feel the same thing. It's, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. But there's a combination, I guess. The thing is that, that the, the, the equity markets are the most overvalued in history, like including 1929. And they've long passed due for correction. So when the equity market's correct, the likelihood is that gold initially, gold and silver initially correct as well, but then recover quickly. But once that happens, then uh, they'll, I, th I think we'll be recovering, um, you know, for, for a major upside. So that, that's what uh, we're facing. But the question is, uh, when? And people always ask me, because I said, well, when is this going to happen? When is it going to happen? I say, well, don't worry about it. Like, I, I bought, and you're, you're probably even longer, I bought, uh, you know, gold when it was 250 an ounce in 98 and silver was 250. And, you know, the average annual appreciation is 10%. Um, so I'm not desperate that, that this all has to happen tomorrow. 
right. uh, to performing the conventional 60-40 gold equity or ec equity you know, bond portfolio. So uh, sit back and enjoy the ride. And at some point, there's going to be a giant spike. I'm going to throw something at you next. Not a curveball, it might sound like it, but uh, you know, I've been following in the Morgan Report. And actually, David Smith's been doing most of the work on this whole blockchain thing. And I've mm -hmm. been writing the editorials. I always write them. No one ghost writes my my work, but you know, looking like the big push from the central banks and the IMF and the big players all want this, you know, central bank digital currency. It's not decentralized, it's totally centralized. And moving in that direction, of course, there's been some DeFi, some decentralized financial instruments out there. So my point, Nick, is this. I don't, I think that some of these precious metals backed uh, blockchain based currencies could be a source of demand that the market really isn't accounting for right now. And before I ask you comment, I'll just have to say as a disclaimer, that I am involved with one and have been pretty much from the inception. I do have some silver involved in it, not where it's going to ruin me one way or the other, but I think that this could be something where if you can buy silver by the gram or the ounce or the whatever with your phone and you're 28 years old or younger, you can do it as easily as in Africa as you can in Hong Kong. I think that could be uh, an area of demand no one's really thinking that much about. What are your thoughts? Well, it's clear that that's that's where the younger generation wants to do that. The, the the big problem that I've always found is is the 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 security of of you know is it is it actually there? Do you have a title? Uh, what are the vulnerabilities with the vault? Can uh, because what a lot of people don't realize is if a vault goes bankrupt. Uh, or you know, in many cases, if they're renting the space or have a mortgage, then the then the lender or the less lessor can repossess the contents unless you can definitively prove that that you own them. In many cases, they're they're not. So th there's there's eventually going to be, uh, I think, problems with with vaults that uh, even if you have allocated metals that uh, the the vault goes bankrupt for one reason or another. So so you get very tricky uh, situations potentially. So um, as as long as you, you know you have title and the security for the uh, metals is there by all means, you know. Yeah. Well I, the way I, I think they, the the biggest thing is going to come because we've been trying to work with pension funds and we've mm -hmm. sold one major Canadian pension fund in our in our funds, but it's the uh, pension funds. If if they, you know, try and move even two percent of their assets into precious metals, the price will be over ten thousand. I smile because I know it's an absolute fact, and I also believe can't prove that there'll be a day when they want to do it. It may be too late. The door the door will close. Uh, you can only put, uh, you know, so much of demand in such a, a such and such of a time frame. Well, because and we're already seeing that in the physical silver market. I mean, even commercial bars have got a markup of like eighty to a buck twenty a bar. So when you see the, you know, CME price and it says it's twenty eight dollars, well, is that just the paper derivative price? And if you want to take it off the exchange, you pay that in a dollar more. That's right. Well, that's that's where at some point you have a a, a breaking point when uh, when when you have this kind of demand uh, because you know whether it's demand from the public or pension funds we, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. So well, let me sit in your shoes for a moment and just reverse roll slightly. What are you going to do when that third largest pension fund in Canada calls you up and begs to get into your fund? What what happens? Well, the the thing that said we've been preaching to them is is that you know you you need to start buying like almost daily when when you're big enough. You're not going to just say okay, well, I'd like two billion dollars worth of gold or silver. Not going to happen. You know. Right. 
Well, that's good. I know you've done as much as anybody I know, maybe outside of Mike Maloney, to educate everyone, you know, from mm -hmm. the retail investor all the way to the managed money, pension fund, family offices, uh, mm -hmm. and that. And, you know, I know because we've talked, you know, not off camera, kind of get the short shrift. I mean, I talked to one of the leading guys in the um, financial planning industry and he was pretty warm to me. But when I said, I just wanted to put out a little bit of the Ibbotson study and bring it to the awareness of the group of certified financial planners mm -hmm. for the consideration. I mean, I wasn't up there as a dealer or anything. I was up there as an educator and absolutely no way, no how, no time. It wasn't going to happen. Well, this is, you see, the, the thing that, um, you know, COVID and, and the latest U.S. election brings out is that there's a lot of psychological factors involved. Uh, normalcy, complacency, cognitive dissonance, that's the the things to overcome. And, and when you look at COVID that, uh, you know, everybody's panicking over it and wearing masks and lining up for the vaccine. It's the same kind of thing. They, they don't, they don't come close to doing any, any uh, contrarian research to get any other, other opinions. And, and it's the same kind of thing. They're so set in their ways in, in terms of what a, an investment portfolio should look like. Uh, it's, it's very hard moving them in, in to consider something, uh, uh, you know, alternative like gold and silver when, when the data and the facts are like patently obvious, you know, gold's average 10% in all the currencies and the pension funds target for six and most of them don't get six. So how easy a decision is that? I know. Well, I know I could talk to you all day. I mean, is there anything that you think is like absolutely key we haven't touched on today before uh, we maybe call it a day? No, I think uh, we've we've covered it. It's every day goes by and all you can do is uh, stick to your guns and you know, do your do your homework. I you know, because if you don't do your homework, you're you're gonna get uh, scared and sell at the exactly the wrong time and so on. So the starting point is to do the homework. Yeah, I agree. Someone asked me, I think, something along those same lines of what did I think was probably the most important aspect. I said education. You've got to be educated on monetary history, how gold and silver have prevailed through centuries, and where we are right now. And what, whether or not you need to know why we got there or not is rather it could be significant, but we're here, whether you accept it or not. And as you said, just to kind of reiterate it, you know, it's if it was seen on TV, you know, that's it. And a lot of the internet's bogus as well, but not all of it. And you at least have to look at both sides. I just, I was taught so early on to think deeply, think critically. And, you know, being a, an engineer and going through engineering school, you're really taught to examine every aspect from zero to infinity. Yeah, but that's the thing it. very few people do. Very, yeah. Most, like I think 85% of their people, uh, you know, get their news from the mainstream media and don't look at anything else and have no idea about anything else. Well, documentary I watched uh, two weekends ago, I forget the name of it, I'd give it credit. I've got a good memory, but not perfect. Basically, it talked about how with the internet, everyone's in their own echo chamber. So they get that point of view and they get it reverberated back to them over and over and over again and get more and more convinced that they're right, never ever going over here and seeing the other side. And the other side's in their echo chamber saying, oh, get reinforced, reinforced. And they, how come these people can't think like it this way? And it's and it made a lot of sense of how big exactly. the split has become. It's like the Democrats trying to get the Republicans to, to change their mind or vice versa. And it's like, Christians, you know, becoming Muslims, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess we can leave it there. It's great to see even virtually. Uh, you've done a lot, you know, yeoman's work. I know uh, we've certainly had our moments where it's been pretty much of a struggle to continue. Yeah. But you have. And yeah. I was great seeing you. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there, I guess. And uh, okay. thanks again. Take care, David. Okay. You too, Nick. <laughs>